according to the syllabus, and I've forgotten this <sighs> Thursday, was it Thursday? When I sent the videos uh, to cover Minister's Blackmail for Friday, um, I had forgotten that the syllabus had Minister's Black Veil also for today, as well as Barn Burning. How many of you read Barn Burning? Don't feel bad if you didn't. None of you. How many of you finished Minister's Black Veil? Okay. Um, trying to think of what to do. How many of you started Barn Burning? Okay, that's what I was kind of expecting. Um, definitely read it. Today's the 23rd, right? Yeah, today's the 23rd. Definitely read Barn Burning for uh, Wednesday. Man, I don't know what is wrong with my brain. For Wednesday, which is the 25th. It's the only thing I have assigned for Wednesday. So what we'll do instead is we'll kind of go back. And if you watch the video, sorry, because you're going to kind of get most of it again. Um, we'll go ahead and discuss the minister's black veil, and we'll get it pretty much all done again. Um, Wednesday, then, we will, yeah, I think we're going to try and do all of barn burning, so that Friday, making sure I'm getting this right, yeah, so that Friday we can try to cover all of a good man is hard to find which we'll probably do. Barn Burning's the longest of the three um, short stories. And if we can cover all of Good Man is Hard to Find on Friday, that'll get us one day ahead on the schedule, which I kind of need because I've only assigned two days for Sophocles' Antigone. So, having said all that, uh, 3.31. If you have your book, turn to 3.31. If you don't have your book, uh, from here on out, you should bring it. <coughs> I don't know what it is in the 10th edition because I didn't write the numbers down. <coughs> Um, hopefully you read the biographical information. Hopefully you, you watch the video so you, you know, any of that kind of stuff I already talked about. But I do want to talk again, just briefly, a parable. What's a parable? Who's famous for telling parables? Anybody? Jesus. Jesus is fam he's famous for a few other things, but, you know, he's a famous parable teller. So what's a parable? Louder? It's a moral story, or it's a story that has a moral of some sort. If you go back to the Gospels, you know, they tell us the stories of Jesus' life and such. Interestingly, in almost every occurrence where Jesus tells a parable, what do the people say afterwards? And specifically in the Gospels, it doesn't tell us what everybody says afterwards. It tells us what the disciples say afterwards. Anybody have a clue? Yes? They don't get the point. If, if a parable is a story to make a point, or if a parable is a story that has a moral lesson or teaching, then why don't the people that Jesus gives the story to get the message, get the teaching? Because a parable isn't a story told to make a clear point. In almost every instance, let me rephrase that, in many instances in the Gospels, when Jesus gives a parable, he prefaces it or ends it, one of the two, sometimes both, with let those who have ears to hear, hear, or let those who have eyes to see, see. In other words, 
If you're in the proper frame of mind, if you're in the proper quote unquote community, you will understand this, okay? And in many of the instances, what happens is after Jesus tells a parable to the crowds, like the Sermon on the Mount is given to a big crowd of people, but then afterwards he takes the disciples aside and they ask, what did it mean? Not the Sermon on the Mount, but parables. And he says, to you it's given to know. And then he explains what the parable means. Like the parable of faith being like a mustard seed. Or, you know, the 11 versus unleavened bread. Or the seed that falls on the stony road and the good ground and blah, blah, blah. And he explains all what it means. So, all that is to get to. The subtitle for this little short story is a parable. So, that's telling us. This is not something you're automatically, immediately supposed to go, oh, I get it. It's supposed to require some work. Or you've got to be in the proper what's called, and I hate this term, but I'm going to use it anyways. Interpretive community to understand it. Okay? Okay. <clears throat> who do you think is going to, or who should, let me put it that way, who should better, and I'm going to go back to Jesus again, who should better understand what Jesus said? A Christian, and I mean a real Christian, somebody who's serious about it, not just, you know, somebody who was baptized and then goes, you know, messes around all the time. Somebody who was baptized and, you know, fully lives the life and reads the Bible, blah, 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 or a Buddhist. Who should, somebody whispered, you would think that person would better understand that. Who's going to better understand Buddhism? A Tibetan monk, Buddhist, or some Bible-believing evangelical Christian who thinks the Buddha's going to go to hell. You would probably think the Buddhist would have a little bit better understanding of that. Why? Because the Buddhist is in that interpretive community. Depending upon what your majors are, or will be, if you haven't decided on one yet, most of us in this room are probably not in the same interpretive communities. If you're a recording industry major and you start talking to me, guess what? I'm not in your interpretive community unless you start just talking about records and CDs and stereos and on and off. But if you start talking about mixing equipment, whoosh, you lost me. Quantum physics, I like to read about it. Whoosh, over my head. Mathematics, go away. You know, just leave, kind of a thing. All right? Interpretive communities. So, Hawthorne kind of expects his readers to be in the right interpretive community. All right. So, he writes this in 1836. He gives us a little footnote at the bottom, warning about Hawthorne. You can never really trust something like that, that footnote. How many of you have read, um, you probably were forced to in high school maybe, Scarlet Letter? Some of you were, okay? Scarlet Letter, if I remember right, begins with the chapter called The Custom House. And it's about where the author, so to speak, found the manuscript of this story. And the manuscript is supposed to be telling us a true story. That's all fiction. It's all BS. It was never found hidden somewhere. J.R.R. Tolkien does the same thing with The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings are supposed to be books written by Bilbo Baggins and then Frodo Baggins that somebody a long time ago discovered. No. I have to say no because there are people, literally, who think The Lord of the Rings is real, just like there are people who think, you know, um, or what are they called? Star Wars. Guys dressed in light, lightsabers. Jedis. That there are real Je No. No. All in George Lucas's mind. So, he gives us a little, little footnote and tells us when, you know, a story like this really happened. He says, uh, about 80 years earlier. So, 80 years from 1836 gives us 1756. All right? 
not quite during the Puritan days of early America. I mean, 1756, that's just 10 years before the revolution, all right? But it's still when Puritanism was fairly strong in parts of New England. So, what's the general story? What's the plot? What happens? What sets everybody ill at ease? Okay, person Hooper shows up Sunday morning, the sexton's ringing the bell, telling people time to come to church, okay? And person Hooper comes out of the parsonage, the house that is given to the person, and he's got this black piece of cloth over his face, and they're like, what the hell? What's he doing? And they kind of, you know, like Moses the Red Sea, they part, and he makes his way through, and he walks up to the pulpit, and everybody's whispering and talking, and he stands there in the pulpit. I don't have a black one. But he stands there in the pulpit and he wears this thing. And they can't see his face. They can see his mouth moving. So they know it's him talking. And he prays with face turned up to God. Notice, not head bowed, hands clasped, but like this. And he reads the Bible and everything. And then he delivers a sermon. What's the sermon about? Anybody remember? Scratch your right. Secret sin. Hidden sin. Okay? What's the sermon do to the people? Yeah, it gives them the willies. For some of them, it scares the bejeebies out of them. I mean, people have to get up and leave, all right? Now, what are we told about Mr. Hooper generally? Before this day, what kind of person is he? Is he outgoing? Is he easygoing? No, he's kind of the term that's used, melancholy. Melancholy is, you know, slightly depressed, we would say. It can also just mean meditative. He's a thinker. He's always got something going on in his mind. He's distracted, in other words. All right? What about his previous sermons? You know, they're okay. They kind of hold the people's attention, but, you know, no fire and brimstone, no do this or you're going to go to hell, no turn or burn, kind of a baptist mentality. Okay? This one, however, is like what? We're told it's like he snuck up behind each individual and looked into their hearts. Okay? Sermon finishes. Everybody beating down the door to get out of the church. Parson Hooper slowly walks. You know, and normally people would greet him and he would talk to them. And now everybody can't wait to get away from him. Okay? So it's kind of odd. So that's the first instance of seeing the veil. That afternoon, what happens? So that's the morning service. Later on in the day, I'm going to skip a whole bunch. Let's see here. Da 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 da. There's the funeral, page 333, for a young lady. So the bell is rung again, calls people to come to the church. There's a funeral, and we're told, 333, last paragraph, long paragraph, bottom of the page. Everybody thinks, well, okay, because he comes out wearing the black veil again. Well, this is appropriate, right? What do you wear at funerals? You don't wear bright, flowery colors. You wear black. It's a symbol of mourning. It's appropriate. So he steps into the room where the corpse is. He bends over the coffin to take a last farewell of his deceased parishioner. This is an open casket funeral. 
A lot of funerals today, caskets, clothes, already sealed and stuff. He stoops so that when he stoops to lean over the casket, the veil, which is normally, you know, like this, does this. So nobody can see his face, but he can see, he's looking directly down at the face of the dead woman, and if she opened her eyes, she would look up into his face. And we're told. As he stooped, the veil hung, this is about, I don't know, eight or nine lines down in that last long paragraph on 333. The veil hung straight down from its forehead so that if her eyelids had not been closed forever, the dead maiden might have seen his face. Could Mr. Hooper be fearful of her glance that he so hastily caught back the black veil? In other words, when he leans over and that veil does this, he almost immediately grabs it and pulls it up to cover his face. The person who watched the interview between the dead and living it's not an actual, obviously, interview. Interview just means, here, means literally what those two components of the word mean. Enter between viewing. Okay? You don't have to have a talk to be an interview. Who saw the interview between the dead and living scrupled not to affirm that at the instant when the clergyman's finger, features were disclosed, that is, the moment that cloth opened up like this, the body shook. Not his, the dead person's. The corpse had slightly shuddered, rustling the shroud and muslin cap, though the countenance retained the composure of death. The superstitious old woman was the only witness of this prodigy. Well, she's superstitious. So what does that mean? If you're superstitious, what do you never walk under? A ladder. What do you never let cross your path? Black cat. And there's things about mirrors and all kinds of other stuff. You know, Friday the 13th is, you know, stay in bed, you know, kind of a thing. Okay? From the coffin, Mr. Hooper passed into the chamber. The mourners, instead of having a staircase, he makes the prayer. It's a tender, heart-dissolving prayer, full of sorrow, blah, 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 blah. Okay? And he prayed that they, his parishioners, and himself, and all of the mortal race, might be ready, as he trusted this young maiden had been, for the dreadful hour that should snatch the veil from their faces. Now, we didn't talk about his morning sermon, but in the morning sermon, he also references veils. So, one of the big issues in the short story is, what does the word veil mean? Well, it means something different depending upon the context. When it's referring to the veil on his face, it's referring to the black piece of cloth. This is not referring to a black piece of cloth. The hour that should snatch the veil from their faces. Well, what hour is that? And what's the veil from their faces? What does the veil do if you're wearing it? Covers, what else? I can kind of make out some of you, that is, I see a body, a body, a body, a body. Far away you get, mm, nope. So a veil is something that obstructs one's view or that hides what one is supposed to see. So the dreadful hour that should snatch the veil from their faces, that the thing that would stop them from seeing what is there. So, one thing to do when you're reading a story like this, okay, tells you it's a parable. What does the word veil mean? For example, in the Bible. In the Old Testament, you have veils, and in the New Testament, you have veils. And you have physical veils, and then you have metaphorical, figurative veils, okay? 
For example, there's a veil in the temple in Jerusalem. Was a veil in the temple in Jerusalem. At the moment when Christ cried, it is finished, and dies, according to one of the Gospels, I think it's John, probably wrong, that veil is torn from top to bottom on its own, seemingly. In other words, the veil is opened. What's that? What's the purpose of that veil in the temple? It separates the Holy of Holies, where the high priest goes in once a year to offer sacrifice for all the people, from what's outside the Holy of Holies. So what is hidden is now open. Moses goes up to Mount Sinai, talks to God for 40 days, comes down, and he has to wear a veil. Why? Because he shines. Not like somebody got a spotlight on him. It's like light within shining outward. And it scares everybody. Okay? So they bury her. Service ends. He goes back home. A few hours later, there's a wedding. Same day. So three services, and everybody's thinking, no, nah, he's not going to wear the veil now. Why? Wouldn't be appropriate. It's a wedding. That's where you wear bright, lively, flowery, you know, clothes. And he comes wearing the veil. Page 334. About, I don't know, again, eight or nine lines in that first long paragraph. When Mr. Hooper came, the first thing that their eyes rested on was the same horrible black veil, which had added deeper gloom to the funeral. By the way, words like gloom, shade, shadow, darkness, are all words that show up a lot in this short story. Okay, because Hawthorne's emphasizing hiddenness, darkness, right? And could pretend nothing but evil to the wedding. Portend, like a prophecy. Such was its immediate effect on the guests that a cloud seemed to have rolled duskily, like duskily, that is, like night. What is dusk? It's when the sun goes down, it's starting to get dark. From beneath the black crepe and dim the light of the candles. Notice, dimming, same kind of thing. The bridal pair stood up before the minister, before the brides, but the bride's cold fingers quivered in the tremulous hand of the bridegroom. So her fingers are cold like a corpse. And the groom's hands are what? He's shaking. Now, could be nerves. He's, maybe he's not sure. Maybe he's thinking, I, I don't really want to marry her. Could be that. Or could be, why are her hands so cold? Hmm. And her, the bride's, death-like paleness. Guys, Assuming you marry a woman, if you marry a woman, you don't want your bride to be death-like pale when you're standing at the altar. Hopefully, there's some blush in her face, and it's not makeup. It's She's actually happy to be there. Caused a whisper that the maiden who had been buried a few hours before was come from her grave to be married. Not literally, figuratively, like the spirit of the dead girl took over her. Okay? So, if ever another wedding were so dismal, it was that famous one where they told the wedding knell. It, a story, apparently, of two people who got married and they died, or one of them died the same day or shortly thereafter. Okay? He raises a grass, glass of wine to his lips, Mr. Hooper does. Why? What's the glass of wine for? What do you do at weddings? 
you toast. Okay? He raised a glass of wine to his lips, wishing happiness to the new married couple after the vows and everything. In a strain of mild pleasantry that ought to have brightened the features of the guests, like a cheerful gleam from the hearth. Notice the contrast. A gleam from the hearth is like a brief shining of light. At that instant, however, what does Parson Hooper do? He raises the glass, and what does he see? Himself. The glass is like a mirror. Catching a glimpse of his figure in the looking glass, the black veil involved his own spirit in the horror with which it overwhelmed all others. In other words, he now sees what? He sees himself like all those out there see him. What is that an example of? Or demonstration of might be a better word. How are we used to seeing ourselves? Whether physically with our eyes or mentally with our minds. We kind of assume we see ourselves as we are or maybe as we want to be or as we want others to. What don't we usually see, however? What you see, and what you see, and what you see. In other words, I'm not where you are right now. Physically. So I don't see physically what you see. Nor am I figuratively where you are right now. I mean, in the back of my mind, I'm saying, yeah, they're bored as shit. They're just, you know, just can't wait to that knee. You can get out of here, kind of. Thing. Okay? He sees what they see. And what does it do? His frame shuddered. His lips grew white. He spilt the untasted wine upon the carpet and rushed forth into the darkness. Why? Because the earth, too, had on her black veil. Nighttime. What does nighttime symbolically represent? As opposed to the sun in daytime. Death. See, sleep is a metaphor for death. That's why you'll see sometime in the graveyards, requiescat in pacum, pacum. Rest in peace. It's rest. You're just sleeping for a little bit, some would say. Okay? Next day, the whole village is talking about crazy person Hooper. Okay? But nobody, we're told, puts the plain question to him What gives? What's the veil? Explain. Okay? But there was one person who goes to him. Who? Elizabeth, who is his fiance. Does she say, right off the bat, knocks on the door, goes in, what's the veil mean? Nope. She goes in, and we're told, page 335, paragraph that adds the 25 next to it, she was unappalled by the awe which the black veil had impressed all beside herself. Okay? She goes in, she looks at him, and she says, next paragraph, no, there is nothing terrible in this piece of crepe except that it hides a face which I am always glad to look upon. In other words, there's nothing scary about this. It's not like it has, you know, satanic symbols or something woven into it. Hawthorne does have stories about satanic stuff. Read um, Young Goodman Brown, okay? 
about all the people of the church who go out and meet in the forest in the middle of the night and sing to the devil and all kinds of weird stuff. I'm telling you, he had some issues, okay? Um, and she goes on, come good sir, let the sun shine from behind the clouds. See, the veil is the cloud, the darkness. His face is the sun. It lights up her life, like all the sappy, syrupy songs say. First lay aside your black veil, then tell me why you put it on. Notice, she doesn't say what it means. She doesn't say, first put it away, then tell me what it means. She says, tell me why you're wearing it. And he says, there is an hour to come when all of us shall cast aside our veils. Well, he already said that, right? At the end of his sermon on that morning. Take it not amiss, beloved friend, if I wear this piece of crepe till then. What's that hour to come? Death, exactly. It's death. So how do we cast aside our veils when we die? See, this is presuming that you have a soul or that you are a soul embodied and that when you die, that soul is released or that soul is freed and that soul goes somewhere and it sees something. St. Paul talks about in one of the Corinthian letters, now we see but through a glass darkly. Glass like glasses. Okay? So if you see through dirty or dark glasses, what do you see? It's kind of like looking through this window. It's not clear, right? It's not clean. I mean, can you make out what's out there? Yes, obviously. But a glass darkly is something that's opaque. You don't see clearly what is there. But then Paul goes on and says, but then we shall see face to face and know as we are known. Face to face means we won't need any glasses. We'll see what? Perfectly. Clearly. All misperception will be gone. So, he says, there will be an hour when we will all see perfectly. What's that hour? Okay, we said it was death. Or some said it was death. What else is it? Is it just my death and I will see clearly? Possibly. But he says... When all of us, I think that's kind of implying not just when we individually die. I think that's kind of implying what's called the eschaton, the end of the age. The end. When everyone, according to Christian theology, meets their maker, judgment day, so to speak. Don't think Terminator. Okay? When we'll all cast aside our veils. That is, and we will all see, and we will all be seen. And he says, I got to wear the crepe till then. The till then kind of gets back to his personal when he dies. And so she's like, um, I don't understand. Your words are a mystery. Take away the veil from them, at least. Notice another meaning for the word veil. Your words are hidden. Make them clean, uh, clear. Explain. Remove the mystery. Because what is a mystery? Mystery is not a novel that you read to find out who done it. That's a who done it. That's a detective novel. Okay? A mystery is literally something you cannot resolve intellectually. It's something you cannot rationalize to. Right? Here's an example. Again, I don't mean to beat the Bible, you know, Christianity um, drunk. It just works with Hawthorne especially. 
the incarnation, Christmas. Yeah, try to explain that. The God of the universe becomes an eight pound, two ounce, 19 pound baby Jewish boy. The one that created everything, right here. Just wrap your mind around that. Try to reason, it doesn't work, okay? Resurrection, dead, alive. Mm, does rationally, you're going to be sitting there thinking about that for a long time, okay? The idea of the Trinity, okay? Mm, no. Rationally, can't really do it. So that's a mystery. So she says, explain the mystery. He says, I will, as best I can. Or as far as my vow, well, what vow? What vow do we know he made? Well, he vowed to marry her. Okay. Not that vow. This veil is a, he says, type. That's why. And symbol. Those are two different things. They are not the same. They are not synonymous. Okay. It is a type and a symbol, and I am bound to wear it ever, both in light and darkness, in solitude, and before the gaze of multitudes. And as with strangers, so with my familiar friends. No mortal eye will see it withdrawn. Immortal eye? Maybe, but no morals. This dismal, dismal literally means dark. This dismal shade, this dark darkness, emphasizing it, okay, must separate me from the world. Even you, Elizabeth, can never come behind it. In other words, if we go ahead and get married, you will never see my face. They're in bed, making love. Nope, it's going to be around my face. Never going to see me again. Okay? So it's a type and symbol. Type... Um, refers to what's called biblical typology. What does that mean? You have in the Old Testament figures who are called types of figures in the New Testament. That is, they point to. We might call them signs. For example, what is Moses, or who is Moses, a type of. What did Moses do for the Hebrews? He led them out of Egypt. He led them out of the bondage of Egypt. He was called the deliverer. Type of for pointing to Jesus. Why? He delivered his followers, some would say everyone, out of the bondage of sin. Whereas Moses didn't cross over the river, type Jordan, Jesus leaves, excuse me, leads his followers over the river Jordan. Just listen to good, any good uh, black southern spiritual song. And they're almost all about going to the other side of Jordan and leaving this side. Because everything in this world is this side. That's why it's all screwed up. Moses didn't go over because he didn't completely obey God. Jesus does because he is God and obeys God. You know, kind of a thing. So that's a type. Give me another example of a type. A person from the Old Testament who kind of points to Jesus, Samson, David, all the judges from the book of Judges, all of the good kings, the prophets, okay? They're all types. They're not symbols. What's the symbol? How about, let's use this example. 
Moses, when they leave the, the Egyptians and everything, and they're starting to take over and, and defeat the various tribes in Canaan, you know, they're having this one battle, Amalekites or something like that, and when Moses puts his hands down, they lose. When his hands are up, they win. Notice what I form when my hands are up. Cross. Okay? That is a symbol of pointing to also the cross, representative of the cross, etc. So he says this thing is a type and a symbol. It prefigures, it points to, and it represents. Okay? So she's like, what gives? What affliction are you suffering that you will never, you know, see with light again? He says, if it's a sign of mourning, sadness, sorrowing for something, I, perhaps like most other mortals, have sorrows dark enough to be typified by a black veil. I have sorrows, that is. I have things in my life that I weep over that can be typified, typified by this. Like when you're in mourning for someone who has died. Okay? She says, yeah, 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 but what if the world doesn't understand what you are mourning? What if the world says instead, like Job's three friends, if you're familiar with the book of Job, oh, the reason all this bad stuff's happening to you because you sinned. God's pissed at you. They were all wrong, by the way, because God says in the book of Job, wrong, nothing to do with that. All right? She says, what if the people start doing what? Parson Hooper has a secret sin. The girl that died, yeah, he played with her behind the church, you know, or something, whatever, okay? She says, scandal. It might be a scandal. If I hide my face for sorrow, there is cause enough. If I cover it for secret sin, and then he kind of throws out his ace of spades, you know, what mortal might not do the same? If I'm wearing this because of some dark secret sin I have, he says, how does he flip that on her? What does Jesus say, again, to the people who want to cast stones, stone, the woman caught in adultery? Anybody know? Let he who is without sin cast the first stone. And they're like, damn it. And they drop their stones and walk away. What's his point? Okay, so you caught her sinning. You're just lucky that you weren't caught. Why? Because you sin too. Everybody sins is his point. So don't be so quick to judge others. That's what Parson Hooper says to his fiance. And she's like, probably. I'm reading into it. What do you mean? I have a secret sin. I don't have a secret sin. I'm a good, upright, righteous Christian woman, you know, church lady from old Saturday Night Live kind of a thing, okay? And then we're told she kind of gets these weird vibes, kind of shudders, top of the next page. In an instant, as it were, a new feeling took the place of sorrow. Her eyes were fixed insensibly on the black veil. Notice, insensibly. She's unaware of it. It's not like she's trying to focus on the black veil. It's like something suddenly grabs her. And a new feeling took the place of sorrow. When, like a sudden twilight in the air, its terrors, the black veil's terrors, fell around her. In other words, she has a perception of the black veil around her that he has all the time. 
And he says, ah, that's me. Do you feel it then at last? What's the it? It's not a physical feeling of wearing a stupid little thin piece of black cloth. What's the it? Gotcha. You are now aware of what? That's the, that's the question. <laughs> I'll tell you what I think it is. You don't have to agree. The awareness of sin, of her personal, let's not use the word sin, too loaded, shortcomings. Use, use what the word sin, the English word sin, is a translation of. The Greek word hamartia, Okay? Which means missing the mark. Like you're shooting arrows at a target. And there's the bullseye. And you don't hit the bullseye, you hit outside the bullseye. Well, that's what missing the mark means. Missing the target. That's what gets translated as the word sin in all the various English new versions of the New Testament. Okay? Not being what one ought to be. <laughs> However you want to construe that. She is suddenly aware I screwed up. For lack of a better phrase. And it does what to her? It shatters her little world. Because what's the little world she has created for herself? And Hawthorne might be my interpretation. I'm not saying this is right. And I'm not saying this is the only one. Every time I teach this, I, I see a little bit more. Or I don't see what I thought I saw before. Okay? The little world she's created around herself just shatters. Lift the veil once, she asks. Look me in the face. No. Nope. And then she says, see ya. And she ditches him. Okay? Now we can skip everything else to the end. Parson Hooper never takes the veil off. He lives to a ripe old age, and his sermons are so powerful, people come from far and wide to come listen to him. Why? Because they make him... They, his sermons make them feel better about themselves? No. It's this weird kind of, I don't like being around you, but I'm drawn to you. Kind of like a moth with a flame. I think moths know. I get too close to that, you know, and I'm dead. But they're drawn to it. Okay? So he's on his deathbed. Literally, on his deathbed. He's lying there. Uh, the veil is barely moving. And the other minister, the minister of Westbury, says, Venerable Father Hooper. Venerable. What does that word mean? Worthy of veneration. Protestants usually don't call other people venerable. Because Protestants, most, not all, kind of say everybody's rotten. If you're a Calvinist, you really say that, okay? We'll talk about Calvinism a little bit later. He says, the moment of your release is at hand, that is, you're about to die. Lift, are you ready for the lifting of the veil? That is, you ready to see Jesus that shuts in time from eternity. He goes, yeah, I'm ready. Is it fitting that such a man, given to prayer, blameless example, etc., should die with this veil covering him? Lift the veil, okay, he says, so that we can be gladdened by your triumphant aspect, by the look on your face when you die. In other words, because he's going to have this look on his face of, oh, there's Jesus coming to get me. 
And he's going to die happy, so to speak. And he reaches down to lift up that veil. Okay? Why is it? I don't know that it is anymore. I haven't been to a wedding in a long time. Why is it that, used to be the case, women wore veils to the wedding service, and then after the vows are all done, the groom lifts the veil. She's revealed, so to speak. Okay? All kinds of stuff there. And he says, never. And the minister then says, dark old man. Well, he just earlier called him, you know, someone worthy to be venerated, and now he's calling him dark old man. With what horrible crime upon your soul are you now passing to the judgment? Just because he won't lift a stupid piece of cloth. Notice what the minister has just done. Not Parson Hooper, the other guy. What is he assuming about Parson Hooper? He's just announced judgment. You're going to hell. And Parson Hooper, with his dying breath, you know, why do you tremble at me alone? Tremble also at each other. Have men avoided me, and women shown no pity, and children screamed and fled only for my black veil? Hmm. What but the mystery which it obscurely typifies has made this piece of crepe so awful? That is, this thing points to a mystery, and it's that mystery that has made everyone shun me. Okay? When the friend shows his inmost heart to his friend, that is, when friend A says to friend B everything that's bottled up in here. Point A. When the lover reveals his inmost heart to his beloved, when man does not vainly shrink from the eye of his creator, loathsomely treasuring up the secret of his sin. So when those three things are done, then, he says, call me a monster. Well, when are the first two going to happen? When is a friend going to reveal to his friend or her friend everything that is in here? It's not going to happen. When is the lover going to do that to the beloved? Mm, the point is not going to happen. When is the person going to reveal everything to God? Okay. For the symbol beneath which I have lived and die, I look around me and lo, on every visage I see a black veil. Now, you could say, well, of course, because he looks around and he's seen through this and therefore everyone has one of these on. That's not his point. What's his point? Why did he put on the veil in the first place? I think it's to show everyone what he saw when he saw himself in the glass of wine. Every one of us wears a black veil. Why? Because we have secrets. And we try to keep those secrets from each other and, if one's a believer, from God. We say, sorry, God, I'll tell you all this stuff. But this one? No, 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 I'm keeping this one for my own. I'm not giving you this one. You can have all my other sins, but oh, this one, I like this one. I'm keeping it. And traditional Christian theology says what? You got to give it all. You got to turn over everything. You got to confess everything, so to speak. Okay? All right, we'll stop there. It's 856. Sorry, went over a minute. So, Hawthorne's Barn Burning for Wednesday. It's, it's about 21 pages total. This was a lot shorter than that. Um, 